at the end of the day, do you ever feel like, oh, I should have done more? I'm pretty sure almost every entrepreneur <laughs> has felt that before. Our level of productivity needs to be better, faster. Well, more than likely, most of the things that you're doing can be taken off of your plate and delegated to someone who probably actually likes doing it more than you do also. I want to introduce my sponsor, Belay Solutions. And actually, three different people recommended them to me before I'd ever heard of them before for this sponsorship. Two of them were millionaires because they highly recommended me recommending it to my clients. They are bookkeepers virtual assistants, social media strategists that can take this off of your plate. It's one of my favorite things. And one of the first things I do with clients is taking things off their plate. I had a client a few weeks ago and we took bookkeeping off of his plate and he was like, I hated doing bookkeeping. It's amazing. And they do a better job and it wasn't even that expensive. And yet I was holding on to it because that's what I've always done. Don't be like that. You can be way more effective in your business when you know what you're good at and know what you can delegate. So one of the things that Belay Solutions wanted to give you guys is a free download. You, it's called Your Personal Guide to a Productive Work Week. So this is all about you and how you can actually be more effective. If you want to check it out, go to belaysolutions.com slash million. Go pick it up today so that way this week will be better than all the previous ones. Now on to the show. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters. And today on the show, we have back my very, very good friend who I think has been on the show almost more than anybody else, Matthew Puller. You should definitely check out his brand new book called The Introvert's Edge for Networking. And he's brilliant at it. Thank you so much for coming on the show again. I'm excited to be here, Jamie. It's always my pleasure to be on your show. And I, I, I'm i sad to hear there might be someone that's been on the show more than me, but I'll let that go. They weren't as good as you. So does that make you feel better? That does. Thank you. I'm <laughs> so take, a little bit of flattery goes a really long way. Is that one of the tactics in the book that maybe we should be talking about? It, yeah, maybe. No, not so, no, not so much. I mean, you and I go way back now. Can I say that? Like you're one of my longest American friends. So I can, really? I think I can say that you, you and I go way back. But, uh, you know, I think that the, the book on networking is really about like meeting someone you've never met before, which introverts really don't like. So that's why I really wanted to make sure we focused on that topic. Well, it's funny. I Maybe I told you this. I can't remember. But one of my very first networking events for business, uh, my mentor made me go. It was like 400 people. I talked to one person. I looked around like, I got my food. I sat down. Like I literally, I went home and sat in the car and was like, I suck at this, which now I like it, but I sucked so horribly bad. I told myself that I was never, ever going to do it again. Yeah. Look, I think everybody does that though, right? Like I, th I think that the problem is that people see networking as this event that they go to and then they're supposed to perform. Like they, they, there's nothing they can do to aid their success before they go. I mean, you see this happen. I mean, with introverts, especially they'll put it in their schedule mainly because they've had a life event, like they've lost their job or they've realized they perhaps don't have an, enough clients to get through the year. So they're like, okay, I need, I need to go networking. So they book the event in their calendar and then they ignore that it's coming up. And, you know, then all of a sudden they get this reminder on their phone or their computer that they've got to go. So they'll spend 15 minutes fighting with themselves about whether or not they have to go. And then they begrudgingly get there. And then when they arrive, funnily enough, it doesn't work out the way they expect. Well, I mean, these days, that's crazy. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, I talk about there's 90% of the success that you're going to have in the networking room is about what you do before you go. Yet what happens is most people just go. They don't know who's going to be in the room. They don't really have a planned out thing to say. So then they get there and they, they bomb out. I mean, to me, it's like, you know, walking onto a, a basketball court, having never, like, don't know the rules, never played before and go, why did that not work out? Maybe I was just never meant to play basketball. Of course, it was going to be hard. You didn't know what you were doing. So if I prep enough, then everything should be fine. That's what you're pretty much saying. Actually, if you prep enough, then you'll outperform everyone else in the room. I mean, you think about the people that are in the networking room. They kind of fit into two categories the way I see it. You've got, you know, those, well, I call them transactional networkers, but those people that are walking around like, will you buy from me? No, will you buy from me? What about you? Do you want to buy something from me? And like, everybody doesn't want to be that person, right? So because of that, introvert and extrovert, really, they kind of look at the average person networking like that. And they're like, I'm not going to do that. So I don't want to do anything salesy. So because of that, they kind of have these loose conversations that don't really cover anything. 
And then they walk out with all of these business cards that you know these are their new friends, right? But they've already got enough friends. They don't have time to catch up with the friends they've already got. So because of that, they throw the business cards on the desk and say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll email them later. Then they convince themselves that, you know, I'll talk to them if they reach out to me. And then eventually they end up in a draw and nothing ever happens. So then they say, oh, networking doesn't work. Well, the truth is it does work. They're just doing it wrong. The problem is that most people go to the wrong networking events or they say the wrong things. And in, in truth, you know, I see, I mean, the same thing happens in digital media, but when you think about networking and the way people explain what they do, I mean, people struggle to explain in two to three minutes when somebody's politely listening to, you know, to the value that they provide. And then when they move online, they're surprised that nobody is interested in what they do. So they get forced into that transactional spammy on LinkedIn. Do you want to buy from me? Do you want to buy from me? Out of desperation. It's the same thing. I mean, if you can't be the clearest, you have to be the loudest or you have to go to the most networking events. And, you know, for me, everything that I do is about, okay, what can I do to increase my effectiveness? And it comes down to making sure that you go to the right places. But I mean, if I go to a meetup, group, I want to make sure that I know who's going. I mean, these days on, in this digitally connected world, you can see all the profiles of all the people that are going. Like, why would you not look them up, introduce yourself before you go? So when you go to networking events, you have a lot more pre-planned conversations as opposed to walking into that person that says, oh, I sell insurance. And now your eyes are screaming, but you can't get away because you've got to listen to them because that's what you're supposed to do at networking events. Okay. I have questions about that because whenever I go to conferences, it seems easier for me to actually find the list on Facebook or the list of speakers or anything like that. But for regular events, can you find a lot of like networking events local? And not that there's that many right now at the moment, but you know what I mean? Locally, <laughs> network events where they'll list without with seeing yeah. profiles? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, so I, you know, I spoke at an event in uh, in Melbourne, Australia, right? So because of this right now, I'm speaking at a lot of Australian events to try and help their economy as well, because they've been like, Melbourne had like a three month lockdown. And so because of that, like I spoke at their event and it was advertised on meetup.com. And because of that, my team connected with all the people that we thought were great people for, for me to connect with afterwards, well before I even went with a structured, structured message. You could say if you're going, you know, meetup.com provides you know, the, the LinkedIn profiles a lot of the time, the Facebook profile of the people that are going, a photo. So if you just paste the name in, you can kind of figure out who's coming. But even a lot of groups that a lot of local events have a Facebook group. And because of that, you can go to their Facebook group or their Facebook page, and you'll see that there's a photo with a whole bunch of people tagged in the photo. So from that, you can then look at the people that are going and work out who you're going to speak to. Actually, there's you know, there was one event that I went to that I actually met one of the senior directors from Dell. And I found out on the, you know, by just searching his name that he was really into Peloton. So I bought up Peloton bikes. I, I'm not interested in Peloton. I just bought up their marketing strategy. And then he talked about how much he loved Peloton bikes for like half an hour. And that then allowed us to create this great bond because I listened to him talk about Peloton. I didn't even need to really engage and say much about them. But because I brought up something that was interesting to him, all of a sudden he felt like we had a strong relationship. Now, of course, if you invest into people, you need to know what to say when they eventually go, oh, my gosh, I can't, really, I, I, I can't believe I haven't asked you what you do or what you're interested in. Tell me about yourself. You have to know what to say. It's not just about doing your research on who's going. You have to plan what you're actually going to say. But, yeah, you can absolutely, I mean, find anyone you want these days by working out what events they go to and then finding them that way and going to events where they're going to be or deciding, okay, well, my ideal type of customer is this type of customer. This is where they frequent. Now let's connect with them beforehand with a, hey, I've never gone to your event before. I noticed that you're in one of the photos. Would you mind just sharing a little bit about whether the event's great and whether I should you know, come along? Now they're going to sell the event that they love and you're going to be the person they go, oh, I've been dying to see you. I was hoping you'd come. Let me introduce you to some people. It's just people make networking too hard because they go into a room of people that they don't know and then they are scared and they don't know who to approach. So they end up walking up to one person, sitting down with one person. And that's the person that they hug onto for an hour and a half, hoping that no one else talks to them. For me, you know, I go by myself, as, as you know, and I make sure that there are a couple of people I already know to speak to. And if I really can't do that, I make sure I go to an event where my ideal customer will be 
so that a lot of my dialogues, a lot of my stories, and a lot of my jokes will land. Because as an introvert, you know, I'm less organic in my conversation if I'm, you know, talking about things I don't know well, or if I'm buying into things that are, are conversations that I'm not usually having conversations about. But if I'm talking about a niche or talking with a niche that I know well, a lot of the things that they care about, I know really well. And because of that, I can generally dominate the conversation. Dominate. So you really become an internet stalker is really what you're talking about. <laughs> like, you're, like, will these yeah. people be, be upset? Like, if he knew that we were doing the Peloton, like, finding out that he did Peloton or something like that, is that weird? Like, are you cool with people? I mean, you're telling everybody this right now, so I'm assuming he's going to yeah. be okay with it. But well, it's, I, in, it's, it's in the book as well. So, you so know, he must I'm, be I'm okay sure with it. Yeah. Phew, phew. But I mean, doesn't that make sense? So I, I love the idea of that. What's the best way of internet stalking someone to find out some of that stuff there too, right? I mean, it was creepy. So, you know, Neville Medora, when I first met him in person, he's like, I'm going to stalk you online. And he found so many different random things I never really Googled myself before. I didn't realize that there was old photos from like 10 years. Like it's kind of weird and creepy. So what do you pay attention to? What do you not pay well, attention don't to? Don't be weird and creepy is the first thing. <laughs> no, I didn't. think you're oh, done. <laughs> so the, the thing is that, so I like, I like to just go in with a plan, right? Actually, so my, one of the things that I, I an example I give is, I'm not sure if you've ever seen the movie Hitch with, um, you, you, yep. so Will Smith in that movie is exceptional. He gets caught out for being the date doctor. And he says, don't you ever think that a guy walking up to a girl, he'd be nervous. He might want to plan. Well, because of that, you know, the, I like to think the same with networking, right? When I walk up to someone, I'd like to know enough about them. I don't need to, like, I didn't sit there and look at every one of his photos. I just quickly skimmed and went, oh, he's interested in Peloton. That's it. Now, the, when, when I did that, he had a public profile. And I think people these days that are very private put their, fo their profiles on private. You know, for me, you know, I have a very public uh, profile and I do have a private pro profile for just really close family and friends. And if somebody started talking about the stuff they saw on that, I'd be like, no. But, you know, you can't access that, right? But the thing is that, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about completely researching them. Like when you go, like I'll give an example. So I went to an event uh, that was that was run by the AAISP, the American Association for Inside Sales Professionals. And before I went, what I did is I connected with a couple of people that I thought that I would want to meet. Now, what I did is I, I, I connected with these group of people and, you know, a couple of them had won awards. A couple of them were like senior VPs in large companies. Anyway, so I connected and literally I walked past one person and his face looked familiar. That was it. And we then got started about having a dialogue. And then I realized who he was from the brief research I did. And then we started to talk about North Carolina because we both lived there and we built up a really great dialogue. Now, of course, I did know that he worked for IBM. I did know that he posted a couple of articles around a specific topic on LinkedIn. I did know that he was part of the association. He was award winning. And I, I knew a couple of things that he was interested in. So once I realized who he was, I could bring those things up in conversation. But you know, when you walk up to someone, they're like, I researched you, I looked at that photo of you and your daughter, and it looked amazing. Like you guys look okay, so cute together. I'd be like, well, <laughs> settle down. No, but no. if you if you happen to be really interested in a specific topic, or you bring up a topic, somebody's not like, oh, you researched me, and that's terrible, right? So there's, there, there's, there are ways to do it. Like, I don't think any girl doesn't type in the name of the person they're going on a date with to find out that they weren't in prison last year or that they, you know, that they at least are, there's nothing scary that they should know about them, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. But in truth, the, the thing that I'm really looking for is who are the people that are in my specific marketplace? So yes, you totally with the person with, with Dal, I did look and check what he was into because I wanted to have, I wanted to develop a stronger relationship with him and he wasn't really in my niche. I was trying to get sponsorship for small business festival, which is a totally different thing that I do to just help the small business community. But normally, you know, my ideal customer is the introverted service provider business owner. So when I'm speaking to the introverted service provider, I don't really need to do a lot of research. But when I walk into a room, I need to know that usually if you think about introverts, a lot of times they gravitate to very professional industries, highly complex topic matter or things like writing. So because of that, if I look at a bunch of profiles and I see that somebody's a ghostwriter or somebody's in finance or somebody's a managed service provider for a technology company, right? And they own their own business. 
then those are the people that I'm going to reach out to. Now, if I look at, now there are different types of profiles, right? So I, when I'm looking on LinkedIn, that's a very professional platform. So when I'm looking on LinkedIn, I can get a good sense of that what that person wants their professional world to uh, their professional world to see. When I'm looking on Facebook, if it's public, these, I mean, you can make them private. If it's public, they probably don't mind who sees it. If it's on Instagram, they probably don't mind who sees it. But again, you don't want to walk up to a person at Dell and go, I heard you were really into Peloton. You want to start talking to them about the fact that you, you know, that thanks again for, for recommending that I come to this event. I'm so glad that I did. And, you know, it, it was great to actually finally meet you. And then in conversation, something might come up and you say, actually, I'm not sure if you've seen the Peloton ads. My, my wife and I are thinking about getting one for the house. Now you've got your 30-minute dialogue, right? See, that's now, amazing, that's, though. That's a segue. That's a, that's a unique skill set for you. I know you're a master at that, but for most other people, they're they're choppy and awkward when it comes to trying to, like, land some piece of information, maybe because they're overthinking it or, or something like that. So do you have ways that we can do that instead of walking up and being like, hi, you know? Like, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of nuances to it that I know you you know about. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing is that, People have to stop getting stuck in their head and realize, especially as introverts, that our superpowers are actually what give us an advantage. Now, being interested, I mean, everyone talk about talk about in networking, being interested, not interesting, right? Well, that is true. But the thing is that most introverts are always trying to work out how to be more like extroverts in networking events. So they're trying to be interesting. But the thing that makes an introvert great is their ability to listen and empathize. So once you one question in, now, of course, if you don't have any intro dialogue, we talk about, you know, how to bring up and have initial conversations. But if you've connected with someone beforehand, you've already had a lot of the dialogue. You know, for instance, if I was to talk to someone or connect with someone on LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm thinking about going to that event that I, and I, I noticed that you, you frequent it, I, you know, is it an event that you feel like it would be a great way for me to connect with the small business community? They're going to say, well, yeah, it's a great event for that. I mean, one of the things that I did when I first came to Austin, I mean, you know, I moved from Australia to the US. If people haven't realized, I don't sound like I'm, I'm from the US. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. When I moved, I left everything I knew behind. I mean, I had family and friends there that, you know, and a connection. I had a pretty good network, actually, but it was all people that I'd kind of awkwardly networked my way to success because of my success in business with. And when I moved here, I literally had to start again. And I mean, my wife's more introverted than I was. So, I mean, us going out and hanging out with people was not something that we both wanted to do. I went out to create a business to, to create those relationships. So I was move, I was leaving my wife at home to go and do these things. So I had to really think about the groups that I wanted to go to. And knowing that my, my passion was really helping the introverted small business uh, owner, I decided that what I would do is I would connect with people that I thought would were really big supporters of the small business community. And this is another really important point before I get into this, is anyone that thinks that their reason for going to networking events is about finding customers is fooling themselves. If you go to a networking room to get customers, of course, the goal is that eventually you'll get clients. I get it. But again, you're not trying to sell in the room. And if somebody brings up, like if you say, oh, I do this, and they're like, oh my gosh, I need that, you shouldn't sell to them in the room. Because if you do, what will happen, and I do this with my clients all the time, I'll, I'll get them to role play what they're saying. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, I need that. How do I, what, how does that work? And excited because I've given them a, a, a you know, a, the question they've been dying to hear. They'll say, well, actually, this is the process. And then I'll, oh, Bob, so great to see you. Thanks for coming. And I'll interrupt them and they're like that's going to happen in networking rooms all the time so you want to turn that into a separate conversation but the real people you want to meet are what i call momentum partners and champions now a momentum partner is somebody that believes in your work and values your work and is willing to introduce you to their network because they believe it is a mission and a purpose that is deserving of their introduction. And you will do the same for them. Not in a, let's sign an agreement, I'll give you a lead if you give me a lead, but in a way that both of you just believe in each other and you share introductions. That is a relationship that is so valuable. Like I talk about Judy Robinette in the book and how actually how I introduced you guys as well, right? But Judy and I have been momentum partners for as long as I've been here, you know, and she believes in my stuff. She, she introduces me to podcast interviews all the time, and I'm always introducing her. And because of that, it's such a great relationship, but it happened because I met her and she's, 
I sent her a few introductions. She sent me a few introductions. We just happen to have been doing it now for going on six years. It's now, six a years champion ago. relationship is different. A champion relationship is somebody that's high level that sees value in your work and is willing to suggest it, endorse it, and give it credibility. So when you go to networking events, those are the types of relationships that you're really looking for. Otherwise, you're always just trying to get those transactional sales, and that's what you need to get out of. But being interested in these people is the key, right? You ask them questions, you can do some research and know who they are. And when when I go to these events, I'll connect with people and say, hey, I'm really interested in supporting the small business community. You know, is this an event that really has the heart of small business in mind or is it just a general event? Um, because I really want to decide whether or not it's the right event for me to come to. Oh, no, this is such a great event for small business for anyone that wants to help. Now we're having a dialogue about the mission that I'm, I'm on. And that allows me to, to have a conversation when I get there and say, you know, everyone I'm speaking to is so passionate about helping small business or so passionate about growing their small business. I'm so glad, Jamie, you recommended me coming. And all of a sudden, we've now got a, a conversation that we can have that's not, oh, hi, I'm Matt. We've already had a pre-existing dialogue. Okay, so question, because one of my clients was asking for one of her new employees also, because it's one thing if you're the business owner, but it's another thing if it's the employer going, oh, my, so they went to a networking event. And she said he did what she called circling. So she'd go, he'd go to talk to somebody and then he'd bail because he was scared. And then he'd go to talk to another person and then he'd bail. And that, right. So of course he needs to do his research beforehand, like we just said. Um, but when you're in that subset, it's part of its confidence, talking yourself out. How do you sort of swing back around and work on that specific skill? Well, because we, because we bashed insurance, people selling insurance earlier, I'm going to use an insurance. <laughs> example right but the the thing is that most people the reason why they're back in and out is they don't know what to say and they're uncomfortable so the first thing i'll give you an example so when i worked with a guy called nick jensen he he was he sold insurance and he usually while i only work with small business owners he was like super passionate about what he did and he just he really needed a lot of help so he said look I'd love to work with you. So we had a chat about what his passion was. And I'm like, well, you sell insurance. So tell me, tell me understand what the issue is. I mean, I can imagine it, but you tell me what the problem is. And he's like, well, when I go to a networking event, I tell somebody I work in insurance and I see their eyes scream and they're staring at me like they're a deer in the headlights yeah. going, how do I, how do I politely listen for long enough that he doesn't feel bad, but how do I get away to the bathroom or the bar? And how do I segue out of this? He said, I just, I hate that. It's like, it just feels horrible. And I said, well, help me understand, like, you got into insurance for a reason, right? He goes, yeah, I, I, I guess. And I'm like, well, what is that reason? He goes, well, I just, I just want to help people. I said, okay, all right, well, let's, let's go deeper than that. If you could help someone that earns $50,000 a year versus somebody that earns $250,000 a year, you know, the person that struggles to get by versus the person that's got a bit of money but, you know, isn't rich but has a bit of money, which one would you like to help more? He goes, well, the $250,000 one because I'll be able to earn more commission. And I went, that's not really what I'm looking for, Nick. But, um, you know, no one wants to hear, I really want you as a client because I'm dying to buy a Bentley. So we need to really think about this and take a step back. And I said, let's talk about two people earning 250. And let's say, what about one person that really studied in university, like in high school, got into university, you know, maybe they studied hard to get into Harvard, they got the top grades, they got that C-level executive job, and now they're making $250,000 a year, and they really earned that position there, versus the person that struggled to start their own business, has a few staff, and they, they grew it, now they're earning $250,000 themselves. Which one of those would you prefer to help? And he said, well, obviously the small business owner. And I said, why obviously? I mean, they're both hustled. Why, does one not deserve help? And he said, well, no, I just feel like they deserve it more. And I'm like, explain that to me. And he said, well, my grandfather owned a farm and he started this farm himself and he, he ended up growing it and employing a bunch of people that he supported, but he didn't prioritize his own health and his own livelihood. And what happened anyway, he got sick and he ended up having to sell the farm and he ended up moving into a little apartment where he, I literally just watched my grandfather sit on the couch watching TV and he just died on that couch for the last 10 years. He said, so I just, you know, I feel like they deserve more support. And I said, your grandfather, like you sell life insurance, like he didn't die, he just had a health issue. How could you have helped? And he said, well, you know, the, I, because of my passion for helping those people, I discovered these insurance, life insurance products where you can put money in to them, your high cash flow, you know, the money from your high cash flow business into the life insurance policies, get high interest, and then you can rotate that into property investment. He said, so that that's the way I would suggest that he would get helped. I said, great. 
I said, what if instead of focusing on selling insurance to everyone then, you just focused on helping those hustlers of the world, those small business owners that have created something out of nothing, not end up in terrible retirements like your grandfather did. And instead of calling yourself an insurance salesperson when you meet someone, why not say you're the hustle lifeguard? Because if you sell insurance, people go, well, I don't want to be sold insurance. But if you say I'm the hustle lifeguard, people want to put you in a box, right? In our brains, we just mentally want to put people in categories. Because if we can't, we need to understand. And eventually, and we want to put you straight in a category so we can disqualify you, right? So when, we, when you go to an event, just say you're the hustle lifeguard. People will literally go, what is that? And you then get to explain on their invitation instead of feeling like you're jamming something down their throat that they don't want to hear. So then talk about your passion for helping the small business owners and that you're on a mission to make sure that they don't get stuck in you know, uncomfortable retirements like your grandfather and then share a story of one of your clients that you worked with that we created three for him that works like that or share the story of your own grandfather and how he got stuck and how you just don't want to have anyone else get to a problem like that. Well, what he found was as soon as he started talking about that, then even the people that weren't in their own small business, they were like, oh my gosh, I want to work with you because they like, how do I get this guy's passion pointed at me? But even the small business owners saw him as the only logical choice. But what was interesting is as soon as he knew how to say everything about what he did from, you know, I'm, I'm the hustle lifeguard to the mission and passion statement to the story, all of a sudden he felt more comfortable approaching. The second thing is most people think they need to go in and say something and make it all about them straight away. So for me, again, knowing who I'm going to speak to is helpful, but striking up a conversation and making it about them makes life so much easier. What drew you to this event? You know, why are you so interested? Tell me a little bit more about what you do, offering them some advice and some guidance or just being their cheerleader. Maybe they just they had they just won an award or they're really happy about something and cheerleading for them or having a dialogue about something that they're interested in, but fostering the relationship with them by asking them questions. Now, don't get weird with your questions. You know, if they've got a daughter, don't ask, you know, is she 16? Is she into this? Right. That's an awkward type of question, but be interested in their career, be interested in providing them advice or be interested in just being excited for them. And what you'll find is there'll be a transition. Now, introverts, if they can go in and be interested, as opposed to feeling like they have to tell somebody what they do, there's this mental shift that happens. And all of a sudden they're going in and they're allowed to use their empathy and their active listening skills and their ability to ask great questions. All of a sudden they feel much more comfortable engaging because it's not about them. And then what will happen is there'll be this turning point where somebody will be like, oh my gosh, I didn't even ask you about you. What is it that you do? And then you say, I'm the hustle lifeguard or I'm the rapid growth guy. And then all of a sudden you then get to have this dialogue with them with someone that genuinely cares because you genuinely cared about them. Yeah, I had to string along a lot of that. Too bad your book wasn't out a long time ago. Because I feel like I, I would write down like some of the questions that you just said, right? Like, oh, what brought you to the event? Blah, blah. Like, I would make that list because I would freeze as soon as I'd be put on the spot. And I also turned bright red. So that's always fun, too, because people are like, what the hell's wrong with you, right? And so I always tried to, to prep as much as possible just because of those things. But I... But I realized that I sucked at a lot of those other chunks that you were talking about. So when they turned it back on me, I didn't know what to say. So each one is sort of has its own separate skill set that needs a lot of practice, though, too, right? Well, you know, it's interesting. So when I wrote my first book, which came out in 2018, I had people reach out to me. And they're like, Matt, your book changed my life. I'm like, oh, great. So you now have a solid sales system that you use all the time. Well, no, I don't really have a sales system like you kind of highlighted yet. I'm, I'm going to get to that, but I haven't. Yet. I'm like, okay, so the story I tell you, you should start with story because story is the most important. So what stories are you telling now? No, no, well, I don't really have stories like what you kind of highlight. Like, well, how exactly has it changed your life then? Because you're not applying any of it. Well, just knowing that I can sell as an introvert is, is life changing. I'm like, well, okay, but that's like not the full journey for me. I want to get you to the life transformation, not just knowing that you can. And I think that this is even more important when it comes to networking. Like when I do podcast interviews, quite frequently people will say, there's no way that you're introverted. Like you can just, you know, you, you're happy to have conversations. You're happy to laugh and joke. And I'm like, yeah, but I've, I've spent a lot of time practicing. Like the first times that I did interviews, I read all the, the show flows that people gave me. I listened to a couple of shows beforehand. I looked at uh, interpreting some of the weird questions that they ask and how I would answer those. And I really practiced. It's the same when you go to networking. Now, firstly, when you first go to networking events, reduce the variables. 
right? Go to networking events where you can research people going in, right? Eventually, I mean, now I don't care what event I go to. I'm, I'm fine. I'm rock solid. But when I first started, walking into a room was terrifying for me. So when I first went, I went, okay, well, there are events that I can't find people that are going. So I won't start with them. I'm going to go to the events. I can find the people that are going. Like, you know, I want to make sure that I know who I'm speaking to. And then I would literally walk around the room like I, I was going to the bathroom. Then I was going to the bar. Then, oh, I, I, I got a phone call. I've just got to quickly go outside. Why? Because I haven't yeah. found anyone yet. Yeah. Remember, walk back in the room, though. And then eventually I'd run into somebody that I connected with in social beforehand. and We'd have a dialogue. Actually, Tom Singer, who you and I both know. Tom Singer was one of those people that I'd connected with beforehand and we ended up having a dialogue and he introduced me to a whole bunch of people in Austin. But that was because I went to an event. I knew he was going to the event. I had a dialogue with him beforehand. He then introduced me to some people and then I knew everybody. But the thing was that that reduced a bunch of the variables, but still I practiced what I was going to say. So one of the things that I always highlight is that you want to make t you want to turn networking into more like the movie Groundhog Day, right? To everyone else, it feels like they're having an organic conversation, but to you, it feels like you're having the same rehearsed conversation over and over again. Now, if you go where your niche is, it's it's much easier. But I mean, my my friends will always kind of laugh at me. Like when I was dating, you know, I used to use the same stories and the same jokes because I found that they worked for me. I didn't like variables. So when you go into a networking room, it's the same thing. It's you want to make sure that you have a couple of conversation starters that you use all the time. If you can't use researched things to start a dialogue, you want to make sure that you ask great questions about them. But there's seriously maybe 10 questions that I ask on a regular basis, right? That's about it. Then what I'm very good at is listening like every other introvert and, in, and empathizing. So I stop thinking about what I'm going to say and when I'm going to get to talk about me and I just focus on them and I ask them great questions. I, I give them great guidance if, they, if, if I feel like I can add value. I suggest introductions that I feel like they might benefit from. And by the way, if you think you don't have connections and introductions that will be valuable. Everybody has a cousin that works in a high level corporation or a mate that started a new podcast. And if the people that you're speaking to a lot of times will just appreciate that you're trying, or a lot of times those introductions will actually be welcomed. And eventually there will be a turning point where they ask, what is it that you do? And if you say, I'm a business coach, I'm a branding expert, I'm a sales specialist, they're going to go, oh, I tried that before. It didn't really work for me. And now you're having that awkward conversation or, oh, I want that. How much do you charge? And now you're talking about price. When you use what I call a unified message, which is like saying, you know, I'm the hustle lifeguard, it changes the balance for two reasons. In marketing, we kind of learn about hook statements, right? Which is those things that kind of get your attention, that draw people in. Like you see them on billboards all the time. You see them on Facebook ads all the time. A unified message fits that exact same thing. It's vague enough to intrigue people to go, what exactly is that? And that then gives you the opportunity to talk about your passion, your mission, and your story. Now, you should script that out. You should practice it. You should rehearse it. And by the way, if you think that's going to make you sound rehearsed, right, think back to your favorite movie. You know, one of the, the people that Jamie and I both know, I think our first interview together we did uh, was at Alex Murphy's mm -hmm. office, right? And when I asked him this question, because he was all worried about being scripted, I said, what's your favorite movie? And he said, oh, Gangs of New York. He just loved that movie. And I said, oh, Leonardo DiCaprio. He's just fantastic in that, right? He's like, yeah, he just embodies the part. He's amazing. I'm like, you know, he's reading from a script, right? He's not really that person. And that's the difference. Like if you read a script, you sound robotic. That's why we have all these tally markers that call us at 8 o'clock at night that we hate hearing from. But when I go to a networking event, just like when I'm on this podcast now, a lot of the things that I'm saying, I've rehearsed many, many times before. But now I'm telling you that I've rehearsed them. Maybe you'll go, oh, wow, it does sound a little bit more contrived. But up until now, I hope you think it feels like a very organic conversation. You can rehearse it so well that by the time you get into an event, it seems organic. And what I find works best is to think through all the things that I'm going to say. And of course, my book shows you how to do that. But you can, if you don't have my book, you can absolutely do it on your own. Think through all the elements of a conversation and think through some of the things you're going to say and then practice those elements. Then ask your friend and I'll say, you know, Jamie, you know, I've got to go to a networking event next month or next week and I'm super stressed out about it. Would you mind being the worst networking person I could ever have met in a room and, you know, heckle me, act disinterested, do whatever, ask me weird questions, try and catch me out. And whatever, you know, Jamie catches me out with, I'm going to write that down. 
I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to practice the response to that so I have it ready. By the time you go into that room, you should be miles, miles better than you are today, and you'll be well prepared. Of course, there are still going to be things that catch you out, but the chances of that happening are a lot, lot less, especially if you know who's going and especially if you go where your niche, for instance, with, with Nick, he knew the small business owners were his clients, so he only went to events where small business owners hung out. See, it's like having a set list, right? Or you're a comedian and you're like, oh, that joke didn't land. Let's try this. There's nuances to everything too, but you don't need anything. You don't need to know everything all the time. And I think that's what's validating and helpful <laughs> for what you're saying too. I remember doing uh, networking events and I'd be saying a story that I know the guy over there had heard the same exact story. Made me a little self-conscious, but it's like we I only had so many stories, right? But you, the more and more you do it, the more stories you have that, some land and some don't. You just don't use the ones that don't land over and over and over again, right? Well, absolutely. And the best way I can explain that is for those people that are married, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever, imagine the first time you told the story of how you met your partner, right? It was probably a little bit more bulky than it needed to be. And you realize that when you were telling it to people and you're like, you know what, maybe I won't tell that part next time. And then there were other parts that you could just see people lit up and you're like, maybe I'll embellish on that a little bit yeah. more next time. Eventually, it's a theatrical masterpiece, right? You say this, your wife says that, you hold each other's hands, you look at each other, and you're like, so that's how we met. And it's just this whole theatrical masterpiece that's, that is well-structured to impress every time. I only tell three stories when I'm networking. I use the same stories, and even though I have better stories now, I still only tell those three stories because I've told them like a thousand times. I'm great at telling them, and learning another story would firstly be a lot of work, and then secondly, it would you know it would potentially give me less results until I practiced it a lot more. So what I always recommend is people always think networking is incredibly complex, and it is for a couple of reasons. A lot of people don't know who their ideal clients are, so they go to a networking room with anyone's your client. So of course. The, the the scope of your sales pitch, the scope of the networking pitch conversation needs to be so much broader. So that's more difficult. So if you limit your marketplace, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, especially for those people that are listening that are like, oh my gosh, any customer is a good client. Trust me, it'll speak just as much to the clients that are outside your niche as what you're currently saying in a really disjointed, horrible way. But for the people that you have that are in your niche, you'll be the only logical choice in everything you'll say. I've had people turn around to my clients and say, oh my gosh, it's like you're reading my mind, like as we're having this dialogue. That will happen with your niche more and more with practice. But the key is understanding that for an extrovert, they can just go out there and wing it. And they will, a lot of times, have great dialogues. Now, I didn't say they'll have great success, right? It's actually, you know, really interesting. But a lot of you know, a lot of extroverts, I'll, I mean, I always say that introverts will outperform their extroverted counterparts at networking, at sales, at public speaking. And the reason for it is, you know, you get a public speaker that's an extrovert and you say, I love that presentation. I want you to do the exact same thing for that group. They can't do it. Yep. You get an extrovert to go to a networking event and say, and say, okay, so go and get leads. They're just happy to be talking. So for me, I'm having a methodical conversation where I'm literally in my head following a blueprint that gets me to an outcome, which is a follow-up meeting, a follow-up conversation. By the way, you have to have in your plan the step to follow up and agree on that before you leave. Not do you want to buy from me, but a plan to follow up with them or a plan to have a follow-up meeting or a plan to send them some stuff because you promised them an introduction or whatever. But you need to be following that methodical, methodical process. You know, the amount of times I'll sit down with an extrovert and they're just excited that they had a positive conversation, but they didn't exactly get what they were planned, planning out of it because they had no plan. For me, I always got to the end. So for an introvert, you have a huge advantage with planning. And yes, of course, planning takes time. But planning means that when you go to a networking room, it's not uncomfortable anymore. You know, my backstory, and I'm not going to tell this story because if you go back and listen to our first podcast interview, you'll hear it. But, you know, my first my first entrance into sales was 93 doors of rejection before I made my first sale. I was super introverted, super uncomfortable. It took me six weeks to become the number one salesperson teaching myself how to sell watching YouTube videos. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, you spent eight hours practicing, eight hours in the field, 16 hours on the weekend. That was horrible. Like, I wouldn't want to do that. And I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But it was six weeks and I've benefited from it my whole life. I'm not talking about months of practice. I'm talking about for networking. It's actually much simpler than sales. But I'm talking, you know, a couple of hours on a, over a course of a couple of days, once you get your strategy right, and you'll do amazingly well. And the best thing is, that once you've realized, and this is kind of the, the thesis of the book, 
is that the reason why you're terrible at face-to-face networking is the reason why you've got to work so hard online to get attention as well. Because if you can't be clear face-to-face when somebody's politely listening for you for three minutes, what hope do you have online? So what's really interesting is the whole goal of my book is to get you to master networking so you never in the room, so you never have to go back to one unless you want to, because that same strategy works incredibly well in social selling, in virtual networking, and just in plain digital marketing, applying all those tactics that people spend way too much time doing because they don't have clear messaging. Okay, you knew where I was going because it's more mask to mask nowadays, right? Than than face to face. So when so when it is online, so let's say for somebody that might be mask to mask or quarantined or or whatever, how do they practice it online when they don't get as much visual cues and people will just ignore you? Do you have like a strategy for the online networking side? Yeah, absolutely. So firstly, online, the way a lot of people know it is not the way it is like 10 years ago. Okay, fair enough. Online was just websites right now. Then they introduced social media, but there, there are a whole bunch of portals now. I mean, there's a there's a, a portal for networking called Lunch Club, where it sets up all these random meetings with people that are aligned with your, your, your likes and dislikes. And because of that, you can actually do regimented networking. You say who you're trying to meet, they say who they're trying to meet. And it does this matchmaking and it does kind of like a, a lunch every day with somebody new you know the other thing that you know i've seen work incredibly well is going to a virtual networking event where they do a what, what they call a networking roulette where they have a whole bunch of people that meet for a few minutes here and there the other thing that i would always recommend is a lot of conferences these days have the people that are attending the conference still advertised and they suggest catching up for 15 20 minute meetings in all the the breaks and retreats so what you can do is you can connect with those people over LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you at that event, but I, sorry, I'm looking forward to going to that event. I saw you were going as well. Would you like to uh, catch up for a 15 minute coffee during the event, during one of the breaks? So much easier. BNI is another great example. BNI, um, BX is another one. These are networking clubs that have now gone virtual and they give you infomercial time. Now, of course, if you don't know what to say, it's pointless going. But if you go and you know exactly what to say and you get to introduce your unified message, your passion and your niche, in a, in a BNI example, you're not going to get time to tell your whole story, but you'll get an opportunity to give them enough about your passion and mission to people to ask you more questions later or reach out to you if they can see that you're aligned with what they want to achieve. So networking is not just, and for the people that are doing this, LinkedIn is not just blank pitching people on LinkedIn <laughs> saying, hey, would you like to meet up for a 15 minute coffee? It's not, hey, would you like to buy my product? Would you like to meet for a 15 minute coffee? And it doesn't matter if you say, hey, how are you all going with COVID? I hope you're all okay. Hey, would you like to meet up for 15 yes, minutes it's coffee? It's so Either. horrible. It's horrible. I yes. think nuts. So one of the things, I mean, I'll give you an example. I was, you know, my book's launching, so I'm trying to get on a few more podcast interviews, right? And I don't happen to know every major podcaster out there like you do, Jamie. But for me, I'm trying to get on a few podcasts. So one thing I was, I decided to do, and again, make it about them. So what I did is I connected with a, a couple of podcasters and I had a load in, on my LinkedIn already. And I picked up my phone and by the way, straight pitching on, on LinkedIn doesn't work, but also sending lots of text also doesn't work. It's overwhelming. And in today's world, when we live in this world where we feel like we're not getting to connect with people, like LinkedIn voice memo is amazing. Firstly, for an introvert, video is horrible because I'm like, it's, it's, it, you know, you can't really do it right. But, you know, with voice memo, I can write a script. So what I did is I wrote out what I was going to say, and then I practiced it a couple of times with voice memo and just deleted the message because you just swipe left to, to get rid of the message. But what I did was I just reached out and I said, you know, whoever the podcast name was, you know, I'm you know, so excited to be connected with you. I was actually just checking out your podcast recently. And, you know, I really enjoyed so-and-so podcast with you know, this person. But I noticed that you have, you know, predominantly small business uh, audience. And I noticed you had nothing really to support introverts, which I'm sure you know is probably going to be like close to 50% of your listenership. So if it would be helpful, I, um, I feel like I might be able to provide a bunch of strategies that might really help them to get past their barrier of believing that sales, networking, and speaking is possible for them, which I think will really open them up to a whole bunch of the other, other episodes that you've created because you've got 
speaking ones, but my worry is that people won't listen to them that are introverted because they'll feel that that's, it's just not possible for them. So if you'd like me to be a guest on your show, I'd be honored to, to help you to be able to achieve that success with your demographic. But by doing that, it was all about them and about helping them. Again, in audio, it didn't come, like that was a lot of text. I can do that in 60 seconds, especially if I've rehearsed it. But in a text form, that's a lot of words. So no one's going to read it. So the next thing is, and Whitney Cole, I know is an example that, um, you know, you and I, you, you and I both know Whitney, uh, you know, when she first came to me, she was struggling to get any clients. And, uh, you know, I helped her realize that her unified message was the mission maven. And we focused on health tech companies. I mean, she was just writing, you know, copy for everyone. But then by focusing, she produced great content and nowhere near as much content as those people with vanilla messages. Remember, you've got to work harder if you're not the clearest, right? So she produced a little bit of content on social media where she just do some videos, a little, a couple of posts, things like that. But she'd also connect with people and introduce herself just as the mission maven so that people connected with that content. But then people would inquire, well, what is the mission maven? And help me understand, you know, I, I specialize with health tech companies. I'm the mission maven. Just little messages, you know, to introduce themselves and then let her content do the work, but then check in and share them pieces of content that they, that add them, add value to those people. So there are ways to connect. Voice memo is my favorite because it gets almost that instant effect. But again, the number one rule of networking, and I really want people to hear this, it's not about you, right? That is the biggest rule that I can give people in networking. Everyone's like, how do I get to talk about myself? How can I get someone to buy from me? If you add value to them or if you look for a way that you can add value to them in any form of what they do, Even I've had people reach out and just let me know about something they've noticed on my website when they were checking out my stuff. And that led to a dialogue because I had to say thank you because I didn't know it was there. There's lots of things that you can add value. Even if you think you've got nothing to add value, there's usually a ton of value that you can provide. And, you know, the, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is you need to be methodical and you need to be strategic in everything you do. I see people that are just sending mass messages to everybody as opposed to if, again, with Whitney, what I suggested just on this podcast, there's a lot more detail in the book, but what I suggested doesn't sound like that amazing. You know, but the different and health tech is a really saturated industry with a lot of highly uh, high level competitors. But because she knew a niche and because she only spoke to that niche and she had stories that spoke to that niche and she constantly brought people back to that same stuff. Instead of all the other copywriters that were out there that just saw her as just another copywriter, they went, oh, we need this. Oh, we need this. We need her. And that is really the difference. So I think for a lot of people listening, it's, you know, strategy before tactics, right? If you spend a little bit of time, all the heavy lifting is done for you. You need to know what the message is, what the niche that you're going after is. Even if you're looking for a job, right? Somebody's going to hire you a lot more if you were always wanted to work in manufacturing or always wanted to work in the manufacturing of a specific type of widget as opposed to, I just want an admin job. Then you need to know what your stories are that resonate. You need to speak to your your passion and mission. And then you need to work out, how to script all the other elements. Once you know all of that, when you go into a networking room, you'll dominate. But also when you're on your LinkedIn, you make sure your profile speaks to that. You make sure that your voice memos all speak to your passion for serving that community. And you have to put in content that actually gets in front of that audience. And again, not buy from me content, but add value content. And don't worry about giving away everything because in truth, most people are lazy. So the more you give away for free, the more people will want to pay you for the advice that you can give. And all that and more is in the book, right? Because they're going to go, but how do I, but how, because there's a lot of nuances to it too. It's not just like, oh, and you come up with a message and you go out there and it's great. Like I know Whitney rocket shipped after she worked with you for a while and it was insane to see how fast she grew, but it was only because she did a ton of work beforehand (laughs) instead of just throwing something out there. Like you were saying, picking a niche, it's not just picking a niche. There's, there's nuances to it too. Like you were saying with the stories. So what was interesting with Whitney is, I mean, she went from, what, $2,500 a month and struggling to get by. It was 60 days of hard work, but then she was she got a $10,000 a month client. And then six months later, she was like $40,000 a month and then acquired. Like she did amazingly well. Like 60 days sounds like a long time, but for all those people that are hustling every day, how many periods of 60 days have you spent hustling going nowhere? So it's really about doing that little bit of legwork and then getting to that outcome. Yeah, it makes all the difference. It's unsexy foundation stuff that will make you a lot more money, people, just so you know. (laughs) So you have to tell us when and where we can get the book. But before we get there, what is one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? 
Yeah, absolutely. So for me, and my publisher hates me when I say this, you don't need to buy my book to get the unified message and and discover your niche. What I would suggest is people go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. And what they'll find is a template that will really allow them to create their own unified message and discover their niche of willing to buy clients. If people do that template, now I would suggest they work with someone to do that template. You know, you've got a great show. So direct somebody, one of your friends that hasn't listened to Eventual Millionaire before and say, hey, listen to this episode. Maybe they'll binge listen to the rest of them. But Get them to listen to this episode and then agree to work with you. And what I would suggest is do the exercise where they work on you for an hour, you work on them for an hour. And at the end of that, you'll have that message and discover your niche really easily. And I did it at the National Freelance Association in Austin, actually. And literally 45 minutes in, I said, put your hand up if you've got that message that you believe will excite and inspire and you've discovered your niche. Like 97% of the room put their hands up. The sad part was the whole session was 45 minutes long. And I said, keep your hand up if this is the most time you spent on marketing in your business since you started in your business and like 85% of the room kept their hands up. So the key is that that template will absolutely work for you if you do it. And I know I, I know, you just told everyone not to buy my book. I can live with that as long as you download the template and actually get to the same outcome. You have to do it. You have to actually do it, people. That's the, <laughs> And then use it after. So it's not just a random piece of paper somewhere else. Because I mean, it does leveling up on the stuff and actually going to the level that you take things which is sometimes a little too far. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> which is, which is, <laughs> well, which you know, is to get results. Though, mm-hmm. I get people all the time that are constantly saying to me, Matt, you know, there's so much legwork in this. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. But how long have you, when you say a lot of legwork, how much time have you actually spent? Oh, I must've spent like five hours on it. And I'm like, okay, well, three networking events where nothing, you got nothing out of them would have taken you five hours, right? Maybe if you dedicate six or seven hours, you'll have it all rock solid, you'll be comfortable with it. And then every networking event you'll go to, I mean, when I even extroverts will go to an event, they'll be lucky if they get one good deal out of it, or one good lead out of it. I go to I mean, I would have gone to less than 10 events. And in less than a year, I was invited to events as one of the most connected people in Austin, having not known a soul a year before, you can get to a point where you never have to network again. But what yeah, you have to understand the strategy. And you know, I mean, one of the things that I I would suggest to people is you don't, again, if you don't want to buy my book and I totally get that, go to the introvertsedge.com forward slash networking. At least get yourself over the hurdle of believing you can network as an introvert. In the first chapter there, I will get you over that barrier and I'll help you understand the stepping stone process. You know, my first book, I kind of highlight the seven step process and I say, if you do nothing more than just take what you currently say in the sales process, fit it in. And then you'll realize there's some pretty gaping gaps. If you fill those gaps and get rid of the things you shouldn't be saying, you'll double your sales in the next 60 days. The networking process is almost exactly the same. If you look at what you're currently doing, you'll realize there's a bunch of things you're doing wrong. There's a bunch of things you're saying, like over-educating the client, opening that fire hose of information you should never do, that you can just cut straight out. And then you'll realize that a lot of the stuff that you should be doing that you're not doing is a lot easier than the hard stuff you are doing. So you'll start to add that stuff in. And as I said, in the first chapter, I'll outline what those elements are. And then that way you can start to realize that it's really not as tough as you think it is. The problem is that you're going into networking events already set up to fail as opposed to planning before you go in, researching before you go in. And that way, when you get there, for you, while it seems organic to everyone else, for you, it should feel like Groundhog Day. Maybe maybe the second or third networking event you go to will feel like Groundhog Day. I love that you said, and they might never have to network again Well, because it will be organic and you'll know so many people that will automatically introduce you because you're amazing anyway. So yeah, let's set you up for success so you never have to network again. That's what all the introverts want to hear right now, right? Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. No, is it? Absolutely. I mean, for me, I, I never wanted, I mean, I never wanted to be the person that was forced to go to networking events to eat every year. So I looked for a process that would allow me to get out of doing it. And the same thing online, I looked for a, a way of doing it where I didn't want to be the guy taking a photo of my donut for something to say on Instagram, right? So because of that, I looked for a methodical way of strategizing that as well. I mean, Jamie, you and I have been out networking, you've seen what I've done. And, you know, I, I had to even say to you, we share that on my podcast, the Introverts Edge Networking, right? So, sorry, the Introverts Edge podcast, you know, how to, how you and I kind of went to a networking event, went our own separate ways. We both ran our own process and then we came back later because we both know how to do it alone and we do it well alone. And that's the other thing I would suggest to people when you go to networking events, go by yourself because otherwise you'll have someone looking at you going, why are you trying to do this? This is different. Can't we just hang out together? 
I remember watching over going, oh, he's doing his thing. I can totally tell. He's doing this, right? Like so much easier to see when you know what's going on. Awesome. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much. Everybody go pick up the book, even if he tells you not to, just so we're clear. It's a book. Just go get the book and actually read it and actually do the processes. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Matt. It was a pleasure, Jamie. I'm glad to be on. Thank you for listening and investing in yourself with your time. I so appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would be forever grateful if you would be willing to leave a rating, a review in whatever app you use for your podcast. I know that's what really bumps it up in the rankings. And I would so appreciate your time, especially if you've been a long time listener. But of course, if you like this episode and you're brand new, thank you for being here too. Have an amazing, amazing day.